guys! Welcome back to Let's Play Xenosaga Episode 3! Last time, we finished up our fight with Margulis and all the cutscenes therein, and then we came back here and did database. This time, more database. Okay, if you are not interested in the database, this episode will probably take place entirely in the database. So, cat videos instead? Tomorrow's episode? Unless this is a Friday episode, in which case, Monday episode? Anyway, um, there are a few notes that I want to make before we go too much further here. Um, the first of which, if we go into Weapons, scroll down to Ames Gins, it will show us um, that there was, in fact, two different models. The Ames that Jin used 15 years ago in Old Milsha, and the ES that he's using now. I guess they're different mechs. This is the only place that even mentions it. They never talk about it in-game. So, I've made that mistake multiple times. There's your proof. Second of all, I was an idiot in previous episodes talking about uh, Dim not knowing how Dimitri died in the Militian conflict. He was killed by Negredo. We saw the scene. I just blanked and my brain didn't work. So, enough of that. Okay, third... All of those uh, panels that we talked to before inside Mictum that I said contain information about certain characters from Pied Piper, those are all in the database. They're just not in the story section. They are logically in the characters section. In fact, the first one here is part of that. Now, most of the information therein is not super important, so I'm going to flash those on screen. In fact, we'll start with those now. Um, there's very few uh, that are particularly interesting here, so I'm just going to kind of show them a little bit. Uh, many of the characters, uh, you won't really understand anything about them unless you learned a little more uh, about them uh, by actually playing the game or reading the transcript or whatever else you want to do. Now, a number of these don't actually come from the same database update or the update file that we got there. Some of them, like Eric's, were just things that we got over time. Now, this one is particularly interesting, um, mainly for this point here. Though his ID showed him to be 28 years old at the time of stuff 100 years ago, his true age is believed to be over 150 years old. Now, that is somewhat interesting, considering we don't know a whole lot about him, and if we're to believe that that's true, then that would be one of the reasons why he's so powerful, because he's basically immortal before this happened. I guess he wasn't completely immortal because he was still afraid of death. He became a testament because he was afraid of death and because he died. But enough of that. Okay, I'm going to cut a lot of my scrolling through the menus to find a lot of these, but some of them I will show on screen, especially if I can find the next one relatively quickly, such as that. Uh, basically, if you want to read these, you can pause. Most of them aren't interesting enough for, you know, me to worry about showing on screen. Uh, this one's not part of the update, but uh, again, it's particularly important. This was uh, Ziggy's wife. Uh, do note that she also was married to a, another uh, police officer in uh, her time, or someone in the military, or something like that. But anyway, the information is here if you are interested in taking a look at that. This one, again, is not part of the da that database update there, but it contains a little more information on, uh, on Jan. Obviously, as you can see by this paragraph here, uh, according to reports, he shot himself in the head as a result of psychological instability brought on by the pressures of the long-term investigation is completely false. The reason he shot himself in the head is because Voyager is an asshole. Plain and simple. And this guy was one of... It was basically like a father figure to uh, Jan and Ziggy throughout the entirety of that game until he passes on. A lot of people seem to die in Pied Piper. Many of the people involved in the investigation died during the investigation. In fact, I think there was like one left by the end of it, really. Uh, save for, you know, androids and realians and robots and whatever else was going on there. Uh, this was the Patriarch at the time. He conspired with Voyager to kill the previous Patriarch, Julius, which we will take a look at momentarily. This one doesn't really do us any interesting bits. It's an android. 
And then if you scroll down to the bottom, they talk about uh, it being made to look female as a secretary and people thinking that's sexist. Admittedly, if you had an android and you were a guy that was straight, what would you want it to look like? That's what I thought. Um, this guy was involved in the one of the original incidents with... Um, try and get most of this uh, to show up on screen there for you uh, with one of the first situations that Voyager targeted so yeah the ambassador lockup incident many of these if you press the square button you can go take a look at related ideas you could take a look at this if you wanted to most of this stuff is contained in Pied Piper I'm not gonna go over every ounce of data from Pied Piper because it's just not that interesting uh, if you're interested read the transcript I'm sure I posted a link or if not just search for the fan translation Pied Piper you'll find it, it here is Ziggy's adopted son, and this is the one he bought the uh, the robot dog for, or the android dog, or whatever he was. Yeah, pretty much everybody Ziggy knew, including himself, all died in very short order during the investigation into Voyager. Including this guy, which was probably one of the two characters that weren't uh, Ziggy and Voyager who were particularly interesting in that series. And she's one of the other ones. She's the one who created um, Scantia, as you'll see as we scroll down to the bottom. She survived the entire incident, and she was, I believe, the only one to do so. And after going through, you know, medical conditioning and all this other stuff for watching Ziggy blow his brains out right in front of her, she eventually united the various uh, anti-UMN groups and formed Scantia. Now, it's tempting to try and relate the only person we know of Scantia from back then to the only one we know from Scantia now, you know, Melise and Doctus, but their personalities are completely different, and uh, according to the wiki anyway, Melise is dead, so I don't believe there's any connection between the two. And here's Patriarch Julius, who was uh, conspired against by the earlier uh, Sergius and to basically kill him so that the earlier Sergius could take his place. Do note that that Sergius is not the same as the Sergius that uh, we fought in Episode 2. They are different people. That uh, was the one from Episode 2 was like Sergius, like the 9th or the 16th or something like that. The one from this timeline is the 14th. And finally, Lactus. Uh, I don't think this one's through the, the that database update either, but it's particularly interesting to uh, take a look. Now, this one, uh, one of early era realians that had been installed with Program Kanan, although the true purpose of Program Kanan is, or rather was, unknown. It appears to have been a system thought up by Wilhelm, who admittedly was alive 100 years ago as a way to detect people with a special trait, which would allow them to become a testament. As a result, Project Kanan's top secret development within Vector, its uh, development process is basically unknown, absolutely no information exists about it, and the, it's built into the base system of the brainstem, and so they don't even know that it's there. Okay, so that's pretty much it for um, all of the characters from Pied Piper. Most of that is just pause and figure out. Here, uh, we have uh, some stuff on Cosmos. Now, the first few paragraphs, we've been there for a long time. It's information we already know. But the current frame, uh, of course, after the battle with Telos has been re-set up, the armor, frame materials, co-generators all use parts from Urtikaiser. Their architecture downsized, consequently, despite not having been manufactured on a legitimate production line, the potential of this unit's body is off the charts, hides a set of battle capabilities that far exceed those of version 3. Okay, so I'm going to kind of go in more so, not really alphabetical order, but categorical order, so anything in cultural will do, and then down the, uh, the list there. Just because even though it doesn't tie all the different ideas together, it's a long area to, or a lot of concepts that I want to go through, so. Uberhumans, or humans made uh, and modified uh, due to the life recycling law, gives them certain uh, types of special abilities, and these 
offspring of these people who were originally part of this became mutants. So Andrew Trenkoff from episode one, Shelley and Mary, um, even Junior and Dimitri to an extent, and we'll get into why that is uh, a little bit later. Uh, again, so di uh, discrimination against them is strictly prohibited, but discrimination and prejudice are still rampant, so it's basically, you know, today! Yeah, we, we think we're not racist, and everybody's racist. And, yeah, to some extent or another, it's basically impossible to get by when you each person has their own individual biases for this or for that or in favor of this or against that based on personal experiences. Anytime you're not looking at it 100% objectively, which for a human is completely impossible, you're going to be biased in some way, which is going to lead to minute amounts of racism or huge amounts of racism, depending on how you look at things. Okay, so interlink. Uh, again, going back to Mary and Shelley, they can do that interlink thing they did in episode one. Most of that doesn't really matter, but uh, the Species Preservation Act makes it illegal to implant devices and jacks into human beings. Mary and Shelley are connected by these interlinks, these jacks, but they are victims of the Life Recycling Act. So this was done kind of beforehand, and in doing that, they were kind of brought in and protected by the Kukai Foundation. Now, here are two terms, ethyl and camel, uh, that basically shoot back. Ethyl is someone who's not in the government and doesn't get any of those benefits. Camel is someone who works for the government or for huge uh, uh, commercial institutions, Kukai Foundation, Vector, uh, the military, stuff like that. And they all have all like these great retirement packages and pensions and all this other stuff. Alan's plan was to retire after working 11 years by a lodge in an isolated area and fish every day for the rest of his life. Okay then, you have fun with that. But basically what they're doing here with the ethyl and the camel is they're calling back to Xenogears where we had the gazelle and the lambs. It's basically the same thing. It's, it's a callback. It's not, well, it's not the same thing. It's a callback. It's a reference back to something they did before. Salvatore, the children of the Messiah designer children, like Junior and Dimitri, these humans who underwent genetic modification during their developmental phase. Ongoing research and development is part of a measure to prevent the immigrant fleet from using a part of the Zohar's abilities. I'm not sure how that really works, but the life recycling law has been a shield allowing the birth of more Salvators. The Yuriev Institute had been controlling research efforts into this. There's more information about uh, that stuff as well. We'll get into that as we scroll through the rest of it. Anyway, the transgenic type realians were created with more human-like structures. They're also part human, as Fabroni has mentioned. First came Fabronia, and then her sisters, which were basically her clones, and Almadal, who I probably pronounced the name wrong. Uh, if you recall, she was the realian that Xion came across in A Missing Year, and who died in front of Xion's eyes, causing Xion to basically break down. Uh, so, uh, the one interesting note here that we didn't really know before was that Mizrahi used the transgenic type data when working to create the 100 series observational units. Divide and rule measure. Basically, this is a, uh, talking about some kind of form of government, but that's not what I'm particularly interested in. It's like a, both the Federation and the immigrant fleet kind of jointly ruling Abraxas or through some... I don't know. I don't understand it. Basically... The more important aspects of it are here. The immigrant fleet appeared in the Mictum system in said year, claimed sovereignty over the planet Abraxas, their holy land, and uh, protracted or a protracted conflict between the Federation and the immigrant fleet began at that point. After about a hundred years, territorial rent rights went to the immigrant fleet. And when the moderate, Julius, and now they call him a moderate basically because he's more, I guess he's more willing to negotiate. He's not hardlined in his stance and there's actually give and take and he wants to kind of uh, apply this divide and rule system. So that's one of the reasons why he was assassinated. 
the Cerebral Sciences Research Center is headed by Joachim Mizrahi. We know this. A specialized laboratory established under Vector Sponsorship that integrated cerebral neurology and phenomena of physics. It's the site of both the original Zohar analysis and Gnosis research. The unique nature of the research caused uh, it to be treated as a fringe element by many, but the center's accomplishment included environmental bugs used every day, DSSSS used pretty much every day, and the Hilbert effect, which, considering how many Gnosis have appeared lately, is used every day. Pretty damn good for science that wasn't accepted right away. In order to analyze the original Zohar, Joachim reconstructed Lemageton, which was being stored by Vector. So they had this. That's nuts. We had no idea about this until just this moment. They began work on the Song of Nephilim and the Udu system. They also produced specialized realities known as transgenic types. And let's see, afterward, a plan was unfurled to use the Zohar as a weapon and an energy source. Jurisdiction was transferred from Vector to the Federation government, and the center, the research center, became the UTIC organization. Now, there are a couple different points where they say um, this group became the UTIC, and then some of the military became the UTIC, and it's basically it's very confusing, and they don't clarify any of it too too well. The UMN Control Center on 2nd Milsha uh, was once a transfer date facility owned by Vector, and even now that it's owned by the government, Vector still provides 98% of the sensor's infrastructure and resources. So basically, they control the UMN, and that's what that final paragraph is alluding to. And yeah, that is the next one I want to go to. This goes back to Pied Piper, so if you're not interested in that. Um, basically, they're talking about all these different facilities that Voyager had attacked. In this case, a placenta facility built to artificially raise the elite personnel who would become the leaders of the future. The genetic manipulation of embryos was carried out during the developmental stage of the nurseries in this facility. Uh, these facilities existed on most of the planets. Records left on the facilities on planet Abraxas. Uh, Draper is just a location in Abraxas. It isn't particularly important. In fact, if they had just avoided mentioning it throughout the entirety of it, no one would know any different. But yeah, they raised fetuses using sperm and eggs of naturally born Abraxas citizens. 18% of government bureaucracy in those years was staffed by people who had been artificially created like this. Facilities are described as byproduct of the Life Recycling Act, but the original goal of the law is believed to have been artificial creation of an elite race with the ultimate mission of linking with the Zohar. So you know Ormus has had their hands in this at some point. Uh, but the thing is, they're not the only ones if you look by the final red... Uh, term there, Yuriev also had a bit of information on this, and he's the one who ended up with all the data. The Tactical Assault Ship Merkaba. There's a bunch of information that we've already learned about, if you want to read that, pause. Basically, Proto Merkaba is the ship's prototype. I alluded to this before, it makes sense, they share the same name, but I just wanted to show you that that particular information was there in case you wanted to look at it. Next, we scroll down to Designer Children. Humans who have been genetically enhanced during the early stages of their conception. They are referred to as Salvators. Hence, you know, uh, Dimitri and his Salvator faction, which is basically in control of everything at this point. Well, well were. <laughs> He's dead now. Anyway, so their appearance, intellect, uh, physical attributes have all been enhanced. Their widespread creation was designed to counter the immigrant fleet, which was able to use part of the Zohar's abilities. It seems to be a trend, but I'm not particularly under sure, sure about it. They did talk about it a little bit in Pied Piper, so there's more information there if you're interested. The life recycling law was actually created in order to mask this process. The first Salvatore, Dimitri, was behind this. So it's just kind of cool to see Dimitri's been manipulating things in his favor to create the URTVs and to do all this other stuff for quite a long time. There's a lot of information on Vector Industries. I'm going to scroll down to three and 
the fourth paragraph, Vector's long history can be traced all the way back to the ancient age of Lost Jerusalem, so there's some more evidence for that. The excavation of the Zohar was carried out under Vector sponsorship, Vector handled the analysis, and Wilhelm is listed as the company's leader from that time. It's unclear what connection this person may have to the current CEO. Well, according to Wilhelm himself, it's not someone related to him, it's him! But I'm not sure if I can buy that. JMI uh, stands for Jacob Medical Imprinting. This facility was shut down when the life recycling law was abolished and following the slaughter of a huge number of fetuses by Voyager, again happened by Piper, all information that had been gathered by this facility was confiscated by the Yuriev Institute and has been said to later reform the cornerstone of raising the URTVs. So that's kind of his end goal. I talked about that in the last point, but yeah, Dimitri created all of this stuff and was behind the Life Recycling Act specifically so he could cr get data to make these URTVs to extend his own life and to battle Udu. The original Zohar suddenly appeared during the ex of ruins in Kenya in the 21st century. We kind of learned about this. Research on it was conducted by Grimoire Burnham, and he, even at that point in time, they completed a link experiment, but it failed, which again lost his daughter Nephilim in the UMN, and in addition to that, touched off a space time anomaly, much like in Milsha, and the result was the annihilation of Lost Jerusalem, which is why no one knows where it is. Imaginary space is the theory, real life theory, that space that we live in is composed of two realities and nothingness. Normal space, which we occupy, and imaginary space, which proceeds along an imaginary temporal axis we cannot perceive. The concept of imaginary time itself is a theory devised by Stephen Hawking to explain the birth of the universe without the use of singularities or belief in God. With it, one can picture the universe without a beginning, the Big Bang Singularity, or an end, the Big Crunch, which I believe, if I remember my very shitty physics that I barely remember uh, properly, it's when the universe retracts into itself back to a singularity. I believe that's what it's supposed to be. I'm probably wrong. I'm always wrong on that stuff. I never remember it properly. But basically, it explains it all. In the story, the Gnosis exists along the imaginary temporal axis and basically are in imaginary space where they can't normally come in contact with normal space until the use of DSSS and the uh, Hilbert effect. The Compass of Order and Chaos is in Wilhelm's office and reacted to Cosmos' awakening which, like, Cosmos has done a bunch of things which you may refer to as an awakening and it's reacted to things that Cosmos has presumably done multiple times, things that Shion's done multiple times. They're not very clear about what it's reacting to. They just say she or he or it. They're very, very vague in this game. Anyway, it uses a plate modeled after the Zohar discovered in Lake Turkana, and apparently uh, he uses the compass to kind of procure assorted information which we know is through Canaan now, but how it works is shrouded in mystery. The Chaos Ring is currently non-functional, so it is referred to as the Compass of Order. I said a while ago that the Zarathustra database entry contained no information, no picture, nothing. Thing is, we even get database entries for all these creatures that we fought. Like, what a waste of time. So much crap in here. Anyway, program Canaan last. General term for a group of systems that searches for people with these special factors necessarily to become a testament suitable for a vessel of anima. So there's two things that are intertwined here, becoming a testament and being suitable for a vessel of anima. Presumably the factor is one and the same, but it's all this stuff of course has been designed by Vector during the dawn of the Realian development. It's installed in a very small number of units and integrated into brainstems so that they can't figure it out. And although these realities are few in number, uh, that is simply relative to the total number of realities because there are so bloody many of them at this point. They seem to be half the people we meet. Especially taking into consideration that they were meant to be deployed across the entire galaxy, um, it seems like there's a small amount, right? So development was conducted under top secret conditions. Of course it was. And of course nobody knew about it. 
Realians with program Canaan implants uh, are recovered by Vector after they have fulfilled their given role. By the 4700s, over 99% had completed their given tasks. However, Canaan, our Canaan, Lactus, has another role. It is reportedly still deployed somewhere in the galaxy, until he's not. The data collected by one Canaan is immediately uploaded to Vector's database via the compass of order. And certain types of data, however, have a barrier placed on them controlling their distribution. Basically, the way I see that is that so all these other realities don't become aware that they have program Canaan in them and, you know, stuff like that. Basically, just to control information because it seems to be what Vector does. Okay, that's probably a long episode. My timer says 34, but I'm sure I'm going to cut a whole bunch of my hemming and hawing and moving from thing to thing, but it's still going to be a long episode, I'm sure. That is all the database stuff we are going to do. Now, what I'm going to do is if you go into the database and you select a file, see it says file there. Now it doesn't. That says new. Now it says nothing. Uh, you can go in there and hit the R1 and scramble through all of them. I'm going to do this in order to make them all appear normal so that any uh, subsequent information that comes up is uh, we'll just say updated or we'll say new so we'll be able to just look at the new information because there's a couple more things we're going to check out not a lot uh, we've done all the data big database updates that there are and all that stuff so anyway that's all for the database for now next time we will be facing a super boss and he's pretty powerful so it's all for this one and i'll see you guys next time